Good morning, everyone. Thanks for showing up when that you know funky big yellow thing in the sky is up there. You know, very strange. Uh, our strange ball of heat, exactly. What's going on? But don't worry, it will go away. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, guest lecture today, uh, George Kaysen, graduate student in my lab here at Port State, just finished his qualifying exam, passed it, and one of the things. <laughs> One of the things that he had to do was talk about CRISPRs. And so I said, hey, he knows more about CRISPRs than I do. And you wanted, remember you did vote, for us to talk about CRISPRs. So that's what we'll have George do. Uh, no clicker questions, so you can put all your clicker things away. And don't everybody leave at once. But I will have some extra clicker questions on Monday. And Monday, don't forget, we will have sprung forward. Don't forget to change your clocks. Because getting here an hour late, you will definitely miss the clicker questions. So um, we're also trying to record this as well. We'll post it on YouTube. Um, sorry about the lecture notes. Um, it's a D2L issue. It doesn't like names that have spaces in them. So I literally just uploaded both a PDF and also uh, the same, exactly the same PowerPoint, but now without spaces. Um, and it seems to have uploaded properly. Thanks to D2L for that. Any quick questions before I go and hide in the audience? Um, so before we talk about CRISPR stuff, we're going to finish where you guys left off last time. I'm going to try not to confuse you um, with what I know or my understanding about what you know and what Dr. Stedman's told you over the last couple lectures. So if you have questions on this part, it might be best to direct them to the audience member, Dr. Stedman. So last time you guys talked about um, post-transcriptional control, post-transcriptional regulation of mRNA. And you guys likely, I hope, learned about the structures that are present and the proteins that are present at the five prime end of eukaryotic messenger RNAs as they leave, leave the nucleus. So you learned about cap-dependent translation. You learned about EIF4E, 4G, the cap poly binding protein. And then at the three prime end of your mRNA, you learned about role of the poly A tail. And so just like with most things, it seems, in biology, there's always exceptions to the rules. In this case, um, the exception to the rule of needing this structure for eukaryotic translation, we have what's called an iris site. And that iris site um, is at the five prime end of an mRNA. The iris stands for internal ribosome entry site. Um, it's a structure, a secondary structure in um, an RNA molecule. And you'll see the difference between the left Laser pointer doesn't want to work. So you see the difference between the left-hand diagram and the right-hand. Um, you'll notice that the cap is now missing on the right-hand picture, but you still have some of the factors that were associated with the cap on the left-hand side. And so you can still initiate translation without the cap being present if you have the presence of this secondary structure called an iris. And one of the the organisms, organisms that commonly uses an iris, an internal ribosome entry site, are viruses. And so viruses will infect a cell. I don't know if this will show up. Viruses will infect a cell and they'll express on. They'll express proteases that lead to the degradation of EIF4G and E, which will effectively shut down cellular mRNA translation, which will bias translation towards mRNAs that have iris sites. And iris sites are relatively common in viruses like poliovirus, picorna, picoRNA viruses that you guys will learn about next quarter if you take virology. So there are different ways to initiate translation in eukaryotic cells. Um, another mechanism by which cells regulate what <coughs> proteins actually end up getting made from mRNAs is by the actual stability of mRNAs. How long are mRNAs allowed to exist in the cell? Um, 
bacteria, mRNAs are made in the cytosol, cytosol in the cytoplasm. Bacteria don't have nuclei, um, so they're pretty unstable um, because bacteria can rapidly synthesize new mRNAs to um, deal with rapidly changing conditions and because they can couple transcription and translation. Um, rapidly degraded from 3 prime to 5 prime by exonuclease activity. On the other hand, eukaryotes have a rather large range of time over which mRNAs are stable in a cell, ranging from half an hour to nearly 10 hours. Um, mRNAs in eukaryotic cells are traditionally um, degraded by a couple different methods. So if we have our common MR eukaryotic mRNA, 5 prime cap, 3 prime untranslated region, and you have your poly A tail there, um, the first thing that happens in mRNA degradation is that this poly A tail gets chewed back. So here we start with 200 A residues. The poly A tail gets chewed back to this critical poly A tail length is around 30 A residues. Um, at that point, you have the 5 prime end gets decapped, followed by 5 prime to 3 prime degradation. And once you've removed, removed this poly A tail, you can also get 3 prime to 5 prime degradation. Um, this process, moving from your long poly A tail to a shorter poly A tail, is relatively slow compared to what happens next. Um, in contrast to that, you can also have instances where you have endonucleotic nucleolytic cleavage. So, again, your common eukaryotic mRNA would get cleaved traditionally in a 3' prime UTR, and then you can follow those same pathways from above. You can have decapping followed by 5' prime to 3' prime degradation, and then also 3' prime to 5'. Prime. Prime. What this endonucleolytic cleavage does is it basically supplies two new sites for degradation to happen, right? You get a new 5' prime end and a new 3' prime end. So how does this um, poly A tail chewback or degradation happens, happen? Well, it's a um, process by which an enzyme, which is deadenylase, associates with the 5' prime cap. So you have a competition here between your trans translation factors and enzymes that chew back the poly A tail. So um, in the cell, basically, um, again, you have the competition between the poly A shortening enzyme and translation machinery. So there's a couple different ways that proteins can interact with mRNA. Um, this is an example by which iron is regulated. So in a, play, or in a situation in which you have iron starvation occurring in a cell or a lack of iron, um, you can have cytosolic aconitase, so an enzyme bound to the mRNA that would normally produce an enzyme involved in, in iron assimilation. So in this case, when iron's not around, you don't have a need or a reason to assimilate iron. So this protein binds to the 5' prime end of the mRNA that would usually code for your ferritin, and it blocks translation. But because you are starved for iron, you want iron, need iron, um, this same enzyme will bind to the 3' prime end of the mRNA that codes for an iron transporter. So you get mRNA translation, you end up with an iron transporter, you can successfully now transport iron into the cell, now you end up, you end up in kind of the opposite situation. You have iron, iron binds, and it releases from um, your iron assimilation mRNA, which leads to translation of iron assimilation protein. And this time when it binds to Again, the same, same enzyme here, it releases from your iron transporter, and this mRNA is now unstable, not translated, 
this mRNA becomes able to be translated. So um, kind of moving from the traditional um, central dogma of molecular biology, moving from DNA to RNA to proteins, um, it's now clear that RNA has a lot more functions in a cell than just telling the cell which, which proteins to make. Um, so we'll first look at examples of what are called long non-coding RNAs, so L and C RNAs. Then we'll look at some of the smaller, smaller ones. So the non-coding just means that these RNAs don't end up being translated. So these RNAs are able to carry out their functions as simply RNA molecules. So one of the things that long non-coding RNAs can do, I'll back up here so you can see that likely since the last time Dr. Sedman presented this, we've moved from a thousand more or less classified or, or well-known long non-coding RNAs to 10,000. So this is a rapidly evolving, changing field. Again, they don't produce protein. But one of the functions that long non-coding RNAs have is acting as scaffolds. So when you have secondary structures in RNAs, proteins can recognize those and bind to those. Um, and so this RNA acts as a scaffold, bringing these proteins into um, a closer association than they would normally have. have. Um, they can also act as what are called guide RNA. So in this case, um, this RNA can now guide this scaffold of proteins to a specific target where it can carry out its specific function. Um, one of the specific functions that it can have is acting on the process of transcription. So you can have this long non-coding RNA um, bound to, or scaffolding to proteins, and it can control transcription on the same chromosome that it's originating from. So here you have RNA polymerase making this long non-coding RNA. And these proteins are now brought into close association with downstream elements. And we call this acting in cis. In this <coughs> different case, you have long non-coding RNA being made. It acts as a scaffold, moves to a different chromosome, and now these proteins and RNA complex can perform their, their function on a different chromosome. Those are the big non-coding RNAs. There's also small non-coding RNAs, and these are generally involved in a process called RNA interference or RNAi. Um, the process was first observed and described in plants. So 30 years ago, a biotech company thought that it would be a good idea to try to make a very bright purple petunia. And so they set out to do that, and they cloned in another copy of what they knew was the purple flower encoding gene into petunias. And they figured, well, the more purple that you have circulating around in this plant, the more purple the flowers will be. In reality, what happened was they got a plant that was producing all white flowers. Nobody really understood why. It took 10, 15 years to figure out that this process of RNAi is what led to um, um, white flowers being produced when you overexpress a purple flower gene. So the basic process is that, we'll move to the next slide, I guess. So there's two, um, two general types of small RNAs that are involved in the RNAi process. One is microRNAs. So these are double-stranded RNAs that originate generally in the nucleus. They undergo you can see undergo cropping here, so they're five prime capped, three prime poly A tail, just like a normal mRNA would be. They undergo processing in the nucleus, are exported to the cytosol, um, where they undergo what's called dicing by the appropriately named dicer enzyme. They become single stranded and associate with argonaut and other um, proteins that are involved in this process. When you have your 
microRNA associated with argonaut and other proteins. It becomes what's called the risk complex. Um, so this RNA can then, is then free to base pair with, um, just by Watson-Crick base pairing with other RNAs that it um, is complementary to. So when you have extensive RNA base pairing, so when you have a good match between um, your risk complex and your target mRNA, you get process that results eventually in the cleavage of your target RNA. So you have binding of your microRNA and your argonaut complex. You have an ATP-dependent reaction in which the risk complex gets released, um, free to go bind to another target mRNA molecule. Your target, target mRNA is cleaved and then you get the rapid mRNA degradation that we talked about a few slides ago. Um, if you have a less extensive match, so you can see all the matches, the base pairing happening here versus less extensive base pairing happening here, this mRNA won't be degraded. Rather, you just simply get reduced translation um, and it's sent to kind of areas in the cell where mRNAs go to die, pea bodies, stress granules. I completely forgot to mention that risk is RNA-induced silencing complex. I should have mentioned that. that. So the other small RNAs involved in RNA interference are small interfering RNAs. Um, generally, these are th they can come from both the nucleus or from an invading nucleic acid. So an invading nucleic acid would be something like a virus, in some cases um, a plasmid. So you start with double-stranded RNA, which is generally um, seen as bad by the cell. You get, just like before, you get dicer action, which results in smaller double-stranded RNAs. You have argon, argonaut and other risk proteins, again, associate. And then you can get basically what we saw, saw previously on the last slide. Um, if you have argonaut and different proteins, so distinct from risk proteins, you have RITS proteins, RNA-induced transcriptional silencing proteins. Instead of mRNA degradation, what you get is binding of your or the original silencing RNA, small interfering RNA to this nascent growing RNA, so growing from RNA polymerase. And what this does is it directs um, chromatin modifying enzymes to down downstream regions here, which modifies the ability of RNA polymerase to keep reading through and making your transcript. So there's two methods by which RNAi works. One sec. One at the level of mRNA and one at the level of DNA. Yeah. So this is directed to the area where the it directs the area where the um, assigned RNAs were cleaved from. Right. So this is again base pairing, complementary base pairing, and this is a growing RNA chain that's actively being transcribed. So this is would be complementary to your original, your original siRNA. And then the DNA is taken that way to get the transcription. Right. So this complex then recruits enzymes that are involved in histone methylation, DNA methylation, methylation and transcriptional repression. So you end up with the situation where this RNA polymerase isn't able to, to su successfully move downstream. All right, so over the last 30 years now, um, these processes have become a little more clear than they were 30 years ago. Um, and so there's a couple applications for, for uh, RNAi technologies. So experimentally, um, 
one of the main problems that geneticists face is determining gene function, linking a DNA sequence to a function. So you can imagine that if you wanted to know what the function of an unknown gene is, is it if you break that gene or if you cause that gene to not be expressed, you can then observe a phenotype and you can associate that gene with, with, um, with the phenotype. So you can now make or have made for you small interfering and microRNAs that you can transfect into your favorite organism. You can see how that organism reacts when they are in theory no longer able to express a particular protein and you can um, ascribe a function to that protein once you've seen that function be lost. Um, there's a couple ways you can do this. You can give your favorite organism plasmids that contain the machinery needed to make these interfering RNAs or in some cases you can simply inject your RNAs, your interfering RNAs, your risk complexes or your RITS complexes already, already made. And that has the advantage of um, not needing to have successful transformation happen, which is a relatively um, hard process in some organisms. You can also imagine that there are medical applications to this, so suppressing overactive promoters and things like cancer might be of medical importance. Um, again, one of the issues that you run into is how, how do you successfully and um, repeatedly get this knockdown of either gene expression or mRNA levels. So one of the things that people um, use are integration deficient lentiviral vectors. So they're viruses that will infect cells that will not, not cause their genomes to be integrated into cells, which in theory should reduce what we call off-target effects. So you are hopefully not inducing mutations to a genome. You're only going to be affecting the mRNAs or DNA that you tell the cell um, we don't need, we don't need these mRNAs. Okay, so that's um, regulation of mRNA. Anybody have questions for me, Dr. Stedman? Yeah. So it's generally linty viruses, L-E-N-T-I. That's the takeaway. All right, so you guys, this means more to you than it does to me, but this is um, the regulation that you guys have talked about the level of post-transcription. So after mRNA is made, what can a cell do to ensure that it only makes the proteins that it, it really needs? So now that you've looked at what you have learned, do you have questions for Dr. Stedman? All right, so what we'll talk about next is a little different, but um, it's relatable to, to um, mRNA stability in that we're going to talk about something that just determines which nucleic acids essentially are allowed to exist within a cell. And so what, what we're going to talk about is known as CRISPR, which, are, which is short for clustered regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. So it's kind of a mouthful. Um, what these are, or what this is, is it's a prokaryotic adaptive immune system. Um, and it's able to complement an innate defense system or defense systems that prokaryotes have. And this is generally targeted towards, or thought to be targeted towards viruses. So just briefly, viruses, um, aren't technically alive. You can argue back and forth about that, but viruses need a host cell to replicate. So up top here we have a virus, which is a protein coat that, that shields some sort of nucleic acid from a harsh environment. When this virus is able to find an appropriate host, injects its nucleic acid into the host, and then in a perfect viral infection, the 
virus is able to, able to make the proteins that it needs. It's able to replicate its genome and move on to the next host. So that's a little bit simplified, but that's what the virus would, would like to do. And it needs, again, it needs all the machinery that the host provides in order to carry out this process, the processes of genome replication and protein synthesis. But it's not that easy, right, because cells have ways to fight back. We have our immune system, um, and up until, I guess, about 10 years ago now, um, it wasn't really clear that prokaryotes had this adaptive immune system. So this adaptive immune system is found both in archaea and in, and in bacteria. Um, so 30 years ago, when genomes were first starting to be sequenced, it was found in E. coli. Function of these clustered regularly interspaced repeats wasn't clear until, again, 10 years ago when their function was elucidated in Streptococcus thermophilus, which is an um, important bacteria to the food industry. And so they had some problems with um, phage infections. And so there was some, there was a reason to figure out how can we um, save our bacteria from dying when they're supposed to be fermenting milk, making cheese, those kinds of things. things. Okay, so we're going to go through kind of the three um, general steps that are, are well, well known now in the CRISPR system. So we'll talk about how does a cell adapt to a virus? And then the two steps involved in interfering with that virus being able to replicate once that cell becomes reinfected. So if you take virology next quarter, you'll probably see this exact slide. But I put this in just to kind of answer the question of why, why would cells, specifically prokaryotes, need a way to defend themselves from viral infection? Part of the answer is that there's a whole lot more viruses out there than there are prokaryotic cells. So this is seawater, and it's been stained so that what you see fluorescing are, is DNA. And so these large dots are diatoms, the medium-sized dots are cells, and then all the tiny dots that you see in the background are all viruses. So there's estimated to be 10 to the 31st viruses on the planet, and so you can Think about how many decimal points 31 is, but it's a lot. And so if you didn't have a way to protect yourself from viral infection, there probably wouldn't be nearly as many um, prokaryotic cells in the oceans, which we can get into nutrient turnover and things like that. But it's important to be able to, the takeaway is that it's important to be able to protect yourself from a viral infection. So. What do these CRISPR, CRISPRs look like? So what you have generally are um, what are called CRISPR-associated systems. And those, what you end up with, you've probably heard the name CRISPR-Cas. And so the, the Cas genes are what determine um, basically the functions of these CRISPRs. There's two classes. I've kind of annotated this figure that I, I borrowed. Um, and the difference between the two classes is, and this will become a little more clear later, is that in class one, you have only, I have that backwards up there, I think. In class one, you have more than one type or more than one protein involved in the interference step. And that interference step will become um, clear later. In type two, you have one protein that's involved in interference step. So We'll either edit this or just remember that this is backwards up here. Um, so you have two classes that are then broken down into two types, type one, two, three, up through type six. The types are determined by kind of hallmark proteins, hallmark genes that are present. There's boxes around each of the appropriate hallmark cast genes here. Um, we're going to spend most of our time talking about type two, because this is the one that's becoming um, a tool for biotech and for medical applications. Um, types one 
and three are found in bacteria and archaea. Type two, we'll talk about maybe why that's not found in archaea a little bit later. Um, type three can target both DNA and RNA, which enables type three harboring organisms to, to some extent, make a decision about when do I target this invading nucleic acid. So in, potentially an invading DNA molecule could be beneficial, right, to a cell. Um, and so type three can make the decision, oh, well, I won't degrade this DNA yet. I'll wait till this DNA starts becoming obviously bad for me by making RNAs. Then I'll, I'll degrade that RNA. So this, these cast genes can be found now either what we call in trans or in cis to the CRISPR array. And we'll find out what a CRISPR array is next. But in trans would mean that they are found far away. In cis means the opposite. OK, so now we'll go through um, the steps here that are involved in a prokaryotic cell recognizing that it's being infected by a virus and what it, what it does to, or one of the ways that it tries to, to deal with that. And so, again, we're going to focus on type 2 because that's, that's the um, system that's being used a lot now. So the first step is to recognize that you're being invaded by a nucleic acid. So in type 2, if we back up a couple slides, you'll see that the type 2 systems are characterized by the presence of the Cas9 protein. So when a foreign DNA molecule enters the cell, this Cas9 protein is going to recognize what's called a protospacer adjacent motif in this DNA. And the protospacer adjacent motif, motif is a sequence of DNA in the invading nucleic acid. Um, which, what this sequence is, what the PAM sequence is, is differs from organism to organism. Um, most common one that I can think of off the top of my head is that the Cas9 recognizes protospacer, or the PAM sequence of any nucleotide, so N followed by two G residues. So N, G, G. When Cas9 recognizes and binds to the sequence, it then recruits another protein complex, which is the Cas1, 2 complex. So you have two dimers of Cas1 kind of on the outside here that are linked by a bridge dimer of Cas2. So Cas1, Cas2 are believed to mediate the excision of this portion of DNA based on Cas9 recruitment of Cas1, Cas2. So now Cas1 and Cas2 have excised what's referred to as, at this point, a protospacer. And then Cas1 and Cas2 mediate the incorporation of the protospacer into the CRISPR locus. So what is a CRISPR locus? Well, you have, reading from 5 prime to 3 prime, you have a leader sequence. So if, if you're thinking about this previous slide, um, your cast genes, in theory, could be up here, separated by a leader sequence. And you have a palindromic repeat. So a palindromic repeat just means from 5 prime to 3 prime prime and then back from 3 prime to 5 prime on the opposite strand, you have the same sequence. So GATC would be a palindromic DNA sequence. So if you write out GATC and then fill in the complementary bases on the other strand, you'll see that 5 prime to 3 prime in both directions is the same. So you have repeats that are separated by spacers. These spacers are viral DNA sequences in most cases. So you have Cas1 and Cas2 with its protospacer, proto because it's not technically a spacer yet, so proto means before. So before it becomes a spacer, it's a protospacer. Um, Cas1 and Cas2 then act as an integrase, so they um, perform nucleophilic attack 
on this repeat sequence in a sequence dependent manner. You can see on both ends, so on the spacer side and the leader side. So you end up with the spacer and the leader side being open. So you get the incorporation of your spacer and then cellular enzymes can then resolve this problem here, reforming double-stranded DNA. So incorporation of a spacer um, results in incorporation of a part of a virus genome being incorporated into the cellular genome. And these CRISPR loci can make up to 1% of a prokaryotic genome. Um, so we talked about the Cas9-dependent mechanism. There's also likely a Cas9-independent spacer integration mechanism whereby you don't need Cas9 to initially recognize the PAM sequence. Instead, instead you just have Cas1 and Cas2 that can perform the integration on their own. Um, if you knock out Cas1 and Cas2, you still are able to have interference happening. So you still get resistance to viral infection. However, when Cas1 and Cas2 are knocked out, not present, you aren't able to incorporate new spacers. Cells no longer able to um, incorporate spacers. If you have, if you put in more copies of Cas1, Cas2, um, you see increased spacer acquisition. And even sometimes you get acquisition of spacers that are from your own genome. So overexpression of Cas1, Cas2, more uptake, more incorporation of spacers, get rid of Cas1, Cas2, you can still see the interference step, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, but you don't have integration then. I don't think there's anything else I want to say about this slide. So this is all DNA. So leader DNA, repeat DNA, all DNA here. Okay, so you can imagine that once you have a, a um, well-developed CRISPR loci that the spacers can serve as a um, molecular memory or roadmap even of what viruses you've been challenged with in the past. So this is blatantly stolen from one of Dr. Stedman's presentations, but it's the organism that we work on in his lab. Um, this is a little bit old at this point, but it's showing, the takeaway is that you can find sequences in the CRISPR loci that are, that are identical to viruses that have infected um, this cell, this organism, this species in the past. So different colored arrows represent sequences that are identical to sequences found in viruses. So this would be a cellular genome now that has integrated viral sequences in its CRISPR loci. Okay, so we've talked about adaptation. Um, the adaptation step involves this virus injecting its nucleic acid. The nucleic acid gets integrated as a spacer into the CRISPR locus. Now the next time that, in theory, that this cell is infected by a virus, by the same virus that was integrated into the spacer region, you should now be immune to that infection. And there's a, a process by which this immunity is, is carried out. So we'll talk about those two steps now. The first step is making CRISPR RNA, so CR RNA. So if we look again at, um, at our CRISPR locus, we have our leader followed by a repeat. Here's our spacer that was just integrated. When you have transcription of this, you end up with what's called a pre-CRISPR RNA, pre-CR RNA. Um, and what this is, is it's repeats and spacers in a long RNA molecule. So in this case, you have spacer, sorry, you have the repeat, spacer zero, repeat, spacer one, all the way out um, in an RNA molecule. So from 
here to here, transcription occurs. So in type two systems, this pre-cRNA then undergoes processing by which you get cleavage of, um, so that you have um, just a repeat and a spacer now as a single RNA molecule. This RNA molecule then base pairs with transactivating CRISPR RNA called tracer RNA. So here in red, you have your tracer RNA pairing with your CRISPR RNA. Um, you have RNA3 digestion that happens in the repeats. So you can see you have more repeats up here than you have down here. Um, so RNA3 digestion in association with Cas9. So the more processing results in this mature cascade complex. And so the cascade complex is the protein Cas9 associated with CRISPR RNA, mature CRISPR RNA associated with tracer RNA. One sec. The two, two, two RNAs, RNAs together, tracer RNA plus CRISPR RNA are called a guide RNA. So the, the RNAs are going to determine where we eventually um, carry out the interference step. Yeah. Okay. So again, cascade complex, Cas9 protein, and then the guide RNA, which is composed of the tracer and CRISPR RNA. So I mentioned 15, 20 minutes ago that type 2 CRISPR systems aren't found in archaea. Um, one of the reasons that that could be is that Moving to a mature cascade complex requires RNA3 activity, and archaea don't have RNA3. So now we have a mature cascade complex. How do we go about interfering with a viral infection? So we've moved from adaptation all the way down to this effector complex. So how does this effector complex carry out its, its task? So I already mentioned CRISPR RNA plus tracer RNA gives you your, your guide RNA. So if we look now at um, the, the structure of this mature complex, um, specifically the structure of Cas9 protein, what you have are a couple um, domains of notes. So you have the PI domain, which stands for protospacer adjacent motif, PAM interacting domain. You have the nuclease domain, the H and H domain here. This eventually is going to cleave the target strand that you bind to. And you have the rub C domain, which cleaves the non-target strand. Um, then up top, you have the alpha helical lobe, which um, holds together your, your tracer and CRISPR RNAs. Do I have the same slide in there twice? Yeah. So next slide. So this is just, again, your kind of your topography of your cascade complex, your effector complex. So now, once you have this mature complex in the cell, um, it's guided to the invading nucleic acid by this guide RNA. So the guide RNA will base pair with the invading nucleic acid that it recognizes. Remember, because this guide RNA is derived from the invading nucleic acid. Um, so you get base pairing of your guide RNA with your target DNA, with your invading DNA sequence. The PI domain of Cas9 will look for the PAM motif, or PAM. Um, if it recognizes PAM, so about three nucleotides outside of your spacer region, if it recognizes PAM, this protein is able to decide that this nucleic acid is not made by me. This is not my DNA. DNA. So when it says, when it makes the decision of a non-self recognition, it can proceed towards 
degradation. If it doesn't recognize, if this PI domain doesn't recognize the PAM, it, rec it decides that, well, this nucleic acid is probably of self origin. I don't want to degrade this nucleic acid. So if the PAM is recognized, you get DNA unwinding away from the protospacer adjacent motif. Once that happens, a conformational change happens in the H and H domain, which leads to that, that domain becoming active as a nuclease. And that conformational change also causes a RUV-C conformational change, which leads to RUV-C becoming active as a nuclease. So here you have the H and H domain becoming active and cleaving what we would call the target strand, so the target strand being the one that's recognized by your guide RNA. Here you have RUV-C being recognized, or sorry, the non-target strand being recognized by RUV-C, and you get cleavage of both strands resulting in a double-stranded DNA break. Then from there, degradation of DNA. So three steps here. So we talked about how a cell integrates a viral sequence into its CRISPR array, talked about how CRISPR RNAs are expressed and matured, and then the interference step. Yeah. The whole complex is integrated into the DNA of the host cell specifically to prevent that replication from occurring to protect the retained uh, DNA from another retained virus and kind of prevent that continuous disease and transfer of DNA, correct? Exactly. So this, this virus that led to the adaptation has to be the same. I guess it would be more appropriate to say this nucleic acid that leads to the adaptation, it's that nucleic acid that is then recognized and degraded. So like we talked about earlier, it's not always quite that simple. Um, of course, viruses aren't just going to let this happen without um, engaging in what generally called an evolutionary arms race, right, to out, outmaneuver the cells. So one of the ways that viruses have done this is by making their own CRISPR-Cas systems. So a nice example, example of this is from, comes from um, the organism that causes cholera. So cholera, big problem um, in the developing world and 100, 150 years ago was a big problem in a lot of places. Um, so the organism itself encodes an 18 kilobase antiphage island. So when this bacteria is infected by a phage, this 18 kilobase island becomes active and it excises itself from the genome and it circularizes and then it acts similarly to a plasmid or even a virus and it spreads throughout the population, population of cells. And this, this spread um, acts as a mechanism to prevent viral replication. So the cells are replicating and spreading this circularized antiphage island, which contains proteins that interfere with the replication of the phage itself. Um, the phage, the virus that infects the cholera, contains Cas genes in a CRISPR array. So you have the Cas genes here and your CRISPR array down below. So when these two meet, when the phage infects the virus, it tries to begin expressing its CRISPR-Cas system. Its spacers are derived from this 18 kb island. So it goes through a process similar to what we just learned about in the cell, except now we have the virus causing um, the expression of this CRISPR-Cas system. So in a mechanism that's more or less the same as what we learned, um, we have an association of RNA with a Cas protein, an RNA of bacterial origin associated with a Cas protein of viral origin, which results in this virus, this phage, 
um, inducing interference against, against this island. And so that leads to a situation in which the phage is able to successfully replicate and move from cell to cell in exclusion to this island moving from cell to cell. Okay, so we've talked kind of about the general biology of CRISPR-Cas systems. Um, now we'll talk about some of the applications that they have. So the, the main um, hope now is that CRISPR-Cas will be able to be used as a genome editing tool in medically relevant situations. So it's, it's well developed now for experimental situations. But the hope is that eventually it'll get to a point where we can use it for medically relevant genome editing. And there's a couple precursors that came before CRISPR-Cas for genome editing, and we're just going to briefly talk about those right now. So first is zinc finger nucleases. So zinc finger nucleases are one of the most commonly expressed DNA binding domains found in human proteins. So what you can see is that these zinc fingers, so they're a protein now that recognizes a specific DNA, DNA sequence. Um, Generally, you have one zinc finger, so you have a zinc finger here. The zinc finger will recognize three bases in the major groove of a DNA molecule. So in nature, these are generally found as trimers. So you have one zinc finger, two, and three found together, which gives you recognition to about nine base pairs of DNA. Um, it's been possible now to make fusion partners due to the development of what's called a flexible linker domain. So you can link zinc fingers together, which in theory should increase your base pair specificity, right? So if you know which amino acids interact with which base, you can engineer these zinc finger nucleases to, rep to recognize a long, very specific sequence, which should um, be able to give you very specific binding to a target DNA sequence. So you have your specific um, DNA binding protein, and then you can fuse that to, in this case, a nuclease. So this nuclease, FOC I, is a sequence independent nuclease. So once it comes in close contact with, with DNA, it's going to cut. And so we can bring it in close contact with DNA using these zinc finger nucleases. We can bring it in close contact to very specific DNA sequences using rationally designed, rationally engineered zinc finger nucleases. Um, one of the drawbacks of this technology, just like with, with a lot of these things, is how do we constitutive, constitutively get this action, right? So we talked about the, the lentiviral vectors. Do you give, in a medical situation, do you give a patient a DNA, DNA molecule that says make these zinc finger nucleases and this nuclease, or do we give the patient this protein complex? So the next genome editing tool, um, we're Talons, so transcriptional activator-like effector nucleases. So another, another mouthful here. So let me back up real fast here. So in this case, each zinc finger nuclease is recognizing three base pairs of DNA. So that's an important distinction that will become apparent here in a second. So talons were originally discovered in plant pathogen. So, so transcription activator like effector nucleases. So these were initially discovered in plant pathogenic bacteria as transcription activators. Um, so again, this is a protein DNA interaction. Um, in this case, you have DNA binding determined by hypervariable amino acids. So you have one amino acid 
binding to, or recognizing and binding to one DNA base. So you can, if you are able to deduce the relationship between which amino acid will bind to which base, you can, can again rationally engineer a protein sequence that should bind to um, a very specific DNA sequence. And again, we have our talon now fused to a non-sequence specific endonuclease. These endonucleases will induce double-stranded breaks. So again, same drawbacks more or less as we had with zinc finger nucleases. So the use of CRISPR-Cas as a genome editing tool is kind of the newest, um, the newest genome editing tool that people have at their disposal. So like I mentioned, there's well-developed experimental tools now, and the hope is that eventually this will become a medically relevant genome editing tool. Um, so just briefly, how do you um, design a CRISPR-Cas experiment, or how would you go about editing a genome using CRISPR-Cas? Well, one of the ways that you could do this is with a two-plasmid-based approach. So on one plasmid here, we have your guide RNA scaffold, so your tools or your sequence that's necessary to make, make um, your CRISPR and tracer RNA in one. So in industry, they call that a single guide RNA. And upstream of that, you would clone in your target sequence. So what gene are you interested in in your CRISPR binding to? What do you want to disrupt? Where do you want to induce a double-stranded break? Down below on the same plasmid, you have the Cas9 gene. That's driven by a very strong promoter. So you have everything on this plasmid that you would need to make that cascade complex that in theory should bind to a specific sequence on a DNA and RNA interaction basis as opposed to a protein DNA interaction basis like we saw earlier. Um, then on a second plasmid on the right here, you can include a what we would call a selectable marker. So you have your selectable marker of GFP, which we can observe in cells. And on the left-hand side, you have a sequence of DNA that's homologous to the sequence to a sequence in your sequence of interest on the chromosome. On the right hand, we have the right hand homology arm, right homology arm, left homology arm. arm. So in theory, once Cas9 is guided to a specific DNA sequence and induces its double-stranded break, there's two ways by which that double-stranded break can be repaired. One is by non-homologous end joining so when you have a double-stranded break, those ends can be resolved back into double-stranded DNA, and that's going to result in mutations such as insertions and deletions, right? So non-homologous end joining gives you what are called indel mutants. If, however, you've also supplied this cell with your um, with a, a homologous recombination partner, you can drive this repair process of the double-stranded break in the direction of homology-directed repair. So again, Cas9 single-guide RNA is responsible for inducing a double-stranded break. Now, because you have homology between your left homology arm and a section of your chromosome and your right homology arm between a section of your chromosome, via homology-directed repair, you can force or choose what you want integrated into your genome at the expense of your target sequence. So moving from here to here, we've disrupted whatever gene that we're cutting in here. And we've introduced GFP. And it gives us a way to look for cells that have been successful in undergoing this process. Yeah. So it's just another part of your selectable marker. Okay. So 
So it helps you, it helps you choose cells that have successfully undergone this process versus ones that haven't. So this isn't a 100, once you introduce these two plasmids into any given cell, there's a chance that this process will be successful, there's a chance that it won't. Being able to screen for cells that are now making GFP is an easy, easy way to pick cells that have been, have, that have had this gene disrupted. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so the the stretch of DNA that you incorporate into your chromosome in this case is going to aid you in picking cells that have successfully undergone this process. Um, so real quickly here, um, we, know, we know that Cas9 introduces or induces double strand breaks. There's also now Cas9 variants that are deactivated. So Cas9 has two functions. It binds to double-stranded DNA and then induces double-stranded breaks. The deactivated Cas9 is able to bind DNA, but it doesn't induce these double-stranded Break. So if you fuse a protein of interest to a deactivated Cas9 variant, something like a transcriptional regulator, a transcriptional repressor, transcriptional activator, you can, um, without inducing a mutation, you can upregulate or downregulate transcription of specific genes. Um, potential medical uses, if we're out of time, fairly obvious, right? Editing the genome could be of medical importance. Um, drawbacks, this relationship between your guide RNA and your sequence is still partially at least dependent on the protospacer proto adjacent motif recognition by Cas9. And you'll remember that there's a relatively narrow um, set of sequences that are recognized by Cas9. Okay, so quick, quick review. We talked about mRNA stability, um, regulation after transcription. Talked about the roles of different RNAs. Talked about the long non-coding RNAs, the small RNAs. Talked about general CRISPR biology, mostly type two CRISPR biology, and then some genome editing techniques. So that's all I have for you guys. If you have questions, I'll stick around for however long you want. Do my best to answer your questions.